we have discussed um, hypothesis testing in general. We talked about a one sample test. We talked about the dependent samples test. And the nice thing about those two is that they're relatively the same test with uh, you know one minor step, um, additional step with the dependent samples test. Um, and the dependent samples test for hypothesis testing purposes is probably a lot more useful than a one sample test. And now we're going to talk about testing two independent samples, which relative to both the dependent and um, uh, one sample test, this is even more useful and used quite a lot. The independent sample t-test is probably, uh, along with uh, ANOVA, probably the, the most widely used tests in, in, in research, especially in the, the social behavioral sciences. So the issue with uh, the independent samples test is that it, it actually adds a little bit uh, of uh, complexity. The idea is sort of very simple. We're just going to take two different sets of people. We're going to compare them, but the process with which to do that is going to add um, some extra steps. So we're still going to do, you know, the six hypothesis testing steps the way that we've done. It's just when we get to step six and actually do the test, it's going to require a little bit more work. So the fact it's called two independent samples um, is in contrast to the last one, which where we had uh, two dependent samples. And the this one's a little bit easier to understand in terms of uh, how we how we get independent samples is that they don't fall in any of the the categories that the dependent samples uh, did. They're not the same people. They're not related. They're not husband and wife. They're not twins. They're not anything. These are different, unrelated, independent people in two different groups. And we want to be able to do something to one group, like a control group, and I'm oh, sorry, like a treatment group, do something to a treatment group and compare that treatment group to a control group to see if there's a difference. So in terms of uh, research methods and stuff, it actually requires... Um, you know, very little work in terms of maybe randomizing people to those groups. Um, it's just statistically, it does require a little bit extra, extra steps. Um, so we're going to go through an example of what this is. Start off with an example of, of, uh, of an independent samples um, uh, approach. We'll talk about well, what makes them independent. What do we mean by independent? And then we got to talk about. We've talked about this, you know, a distribution of, of sample means. We call them sampling distributions. Well, we're going to talk about different sampling distribution, which is instead of just being of uh, a sampling distribution of, of means or, or of uh, means for uh, samples, we have to distribute differences between means. We got to figure out how what's the range of possible differences between means we would expect given two samples of of specific sizes. Um, so we're going to talk about how that works and what that means. And um, we're going to talk about this idea of uh, heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity of variance or homogeneity of variance, depending on which side of the coin you're talking about, um, and sort of how that impacts things and how we do this. Um, and then we'll revisit this idea of effect size and then uh, talk about confidence limits, confidence intervals for um, independent samples as well. So it's, it should follow generally the same format as the last two um, lectures in terms of the steps, the processes we'll, we'll go through with a little bit added things in here like um, are, are the variances the same, which is what homogeneity variances is, or are we sort of violating that with this heterogeneity of variance? All right, so here's our example. I was trying to think of an example that would be uh, interesting, at least uh, to some degree. And uh, I remember when... I was younger, a kid. The big debate was about uh, television and movies and things sort of causing kids to become violent. That uh, you know, if you wa if a kid watches violent television, um, they'll become violent. And it sort of morphed later into becoming well, if kids play violent video games, they'll become violent. And there's this, um, it's still a lingering thing that there's a, an assumption of cause and effect there. Uh, the issue with that, and we'll talk about this later on the correlation, there may be a relationship between uh, aggressive behaviors and kids and, and the, the types of games that they're playing, 
but it's just as easy to assume that aggressive kids would be drawn to aggressive or violent games. So the, the cause and effect part becomes a little tricky. So I thought, okay, well, what if I wanted to look into what that would look like? How do we go about operationalizing and testing something like this? So this is what I came up with. Uh, again, not perfect, but just to give you an example. So let's say I wanted to try to control as best I can two different conditions, one of which uh, I'm calling the sort of the, the violent condition and one that is a nonviolent condition. Well, I had to find two games that were similar enough in lots of ways. The gameplay was similar. There's similar types of things that you would do, one of which included lots of violent uh, components and the other one that did not, so that we can control out everything that is not about the violence. So, it's, so what would be nice is if we had the exact same game that somehow removed the violence out or something, but that's, we don't have that, at least uh, not readily available that I know of. So uh, what I did was I, 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 these two games, Grand Theft Auto V, which now is a little bit older, Grand Theft Auto V is sort of an open world um, game where you know you have full run of a city, or actually in most of the time a, a few different cities. And um, it, by definition, I would, I would say this is a violent video game. It, it, at one point, it was considered one of the m most violent, um, mainly because of the, you can just do whatever you want, and there's, uh, you actually sort of get rewarded for doing awful things. I remember the first time I played a Grand Theft Auto game, um, just the, the amazing things that you can do and get away with, and it's pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, like one of the things, just to give you an example, this is not meant to like offend or, any, or anybody or, or, or anything, but just to give you an example of the, the degree of craziness in the game, uh, during the gameplay in this particular game. So first off, uh, you can, at least in, I don't know, if, uh, in Grand Theft Auto V, but in earlier versions, you could pick up prostitutes in the game. And you can then uh, pay them to have sex with you. It doesn't actually show the, the actual act, but usually it's in a car or something. And then you would, um, your money would go down and your health would go up right? as, as a sort of part of the game, which is insane. But then afterwards, you can, and it's per perfectly uh, feasible, to then uh, like kill the prostitute and get your money back. So this is, the level of violence is pretty crazy in this particular game. Okay, it's rated mature. There's lots of uh, missions and things that are just sort of ridiculous. Okay, um, this game is similar in the sense it's an open world game where you are, um, you know, the same kind of thing. It's 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 a uh, a lot of the same kinds of missions that, with the non-violent part. You're going to try to save somebody or the, you know to retrieve something. The same similar kind of gameplay. It's not perfect. It's not per a perfect match, but it's it's fairly similar. Um, and it's, you know, that's sort of a non-violent and it's sort of rated everyone. So it doesn't have the mature content. It's not violent in any way. So the idea here is that if we were, if we're trying to see the effect that playing violent video games has on people's aggression, well, then we can take 20 people. We can randomly select, uh, randomly select 20 people. And we want people who, you know, don't regularly play video games very much. They have to be... It can't be completely clueless, because that'll be, may defeat the purpose. But uh, low to moderate gamers with no experience with either game. So someone who's not played these particular games. And we want to randomly assign them to play one of them. The sort of violent versus non-violent um, conditions. And then um, have them play the game for eight hours. It doesn't necessarily have to be eight hours in a row. But, you know, have them play, you know, eight hours of the game. And then um, afterwards, we sort of measure their uh, level of aggression, aggressive behaviors. And I'm being purposely vague here because I'm not exactly sure exactly how, how that would work. But let's say there's some, some decent way of doing that, that we can measure their, their aggressive behavior sort of after playing the game. So a couple things to keep in mind. So let's say we assign these 20 people. And of the 10 people who got assigned to the Grand Theft Auto game, um, Let's say that you know two of the people that were playing it, you know, didn't really like playing the violent video game, and, and after about a half hour or so, it was like I don't want to do this anymore, and they dropped out. So th the reason why I added this in here, which for no other reason except that, oftentimes we may plan out a study to have equal n, like to have. Um, 10 people in each group it doesn't actually mean that that's going to happen. So in this case, we're now going to have in the end eight um, 
participants in one condition, 10 in another, and it's also to indicate that you don't have to have equal n, that the, the, this process works even when you have different groups of different sizes, okay? So we're assuming that this is, you know, this is obviously all uh, made up, but let's say this actually happened. We, we had them play the game for eight hours, or whatever, and we were able to measure their aggression afterwards. And um, this is what we find. Okay, so here's the data that we collect, okay? So the other people playing Grand Theft Auto, right? So here's, you know, their, whatever, however you want to define aggressive behaviors. I didn't feel like trying to get, you know, philosophical and, or uh, operationally define it in some crazy way. So let's just assume that, it, that it's possible and it, it's a, a decent operationalization of aggression. And these numbers represent the number of sort of aggressive acts or something where the higher numbers represent more aggression. So you have, um, you know, eight folks in the Grand Theft Auto version. You have um, on the 10 folks in the Lego version. And you see that there definitely is, you know, uh, at least a couple unit difference between the two. And uh, with Grand Theft Auto having more, uh, more aggression than Lego. So uh, one thing I should mention, and you can see that some, you know, there are some of the, of the, the participants, even in the Lego group, you know they had they they had a decent amount of of aggression aggressive behaviors uh, relative to the Grand Theft Auto, but for the most part they were all lower. Because one of the things that's interesting about looking at uh, theorizing about how gameplay or TV or whatever um, works with aggression is that that this is one of the places where there are there are theories that are literally in opposition of one another. So one theory is that you know if you're exposed to violent content like a violent video game or a movie or something like that, it's gonna it's gonna drive you to um, more aggression. Or if you listen to aggressive music like really hard, fast music, that's gonna make you more you know aggressive. The reverse is also theorized to be true that by playing um, like a game or listening to music or watching violent television or seeing violent images, it could actually help you to channel your aggression into those images in terms of it being somewhat, I don't know, cathartic or something. And it actually could help you release your aggressive um, energy. So it's it's perfectly possible to have a reverse hypothesis where we might we might assume that the Grand Theft Auto folks would become less aggressive by getting their aggression out in the game, where the Lego group may be more aggressive because they weren't able to get their aggression out. That doesn't look like the case here, but um, just to you know to, to be sort of thorough that you can we could have a different. Um, almost reverse hypothesis about this, but we're going to stick with the idea that we're going to test if playing a violent video game leads to more aggression, so we're going to be testing it in that direction. Okay. Alright, so what makes samples in this video game independent, or in this video game example, independent? So they're not the same people, right? We said that sort of, so let's go back to the, the instruction. The 20 participants randomly selected. So we got them from the population randomly. So random selection doesn't really address the issue of them being independent. It more addresses the, our ability to infer back to the population. So um, if we collect people or select people randomly from a population, um, it makes them better representatives of the population. So if we randomly select them, whatever we do with them, whatever we find out about them, it makes it easier for us to infer that information back to the population they came from because we chose them randomly. Okay? What makes it interesting is this idea of random assignment. They were randomly assigned to conditions. So we brought 20 people in, and uh, however they did it, they could have flipped a coin, right? For each person, they flip a coin. It has their Grand Theft Auto tails, their the the Lego um, Lego game. But there was some random process in which people were assigned to one of two conditions, um, and because they're randomly selected and they're randomly assigned, the people aren't related. They aren't, you know, husband and wife. They're, the the chances of those kinds of things occurring are very low because of the random selection mixed with the random assignment. So these, so these are two different independent groups of people that were randomly assigned to condition, um, which makes them independent, okay? So samples are independent if, if participants in each sample are not related in any way. Obviously, that makes sense. They, if they're independent because they're not dependent, okay? Samples can be considered independent for two basic reasons. 
So they don't actually have to be randomly assigned um, or anything, but they could just be from two different populations. So if I take a random selection of two different pop from two different populations, um, I take a random selection of uh, U.S. Uh, res you know U.S. Uh, United States citizens and French citizens, because they're from two different populations that don't overlap, they're going to be independent. Okay, so random selection from population one, random selection from population two. And these could also be subpopulations. This could be uh, U.S. men and U.S. women. And uh, because we're randomly selecting from those two, it's the likelihood of them being related or married or whatever, it's possible, but the chances are very, very, very low, and um, they're going to be two independent samples. Right? So they're independent because they're from different sources. We got them from different places. They're different populations. That's not the case for our study. Right? So in our study, we could also, uh, samples can be independent. The participants in each sample are not related to the rate. Second, the participants are randomly selected from a single population, <clears throat> and then randomly assigned. So this is what, what sort of fits in with our example a little better, that we are grabbing, you know, the, we have one population, like right? U.S. citizens or, I don't know, college students, or this even could be CSUN students. We randomly select a bunch of CSUN students, and then randomly, by some random process or another, we assign them to either be in sample one or sample two, like the Grand Theft Auto uh, group or the Lego group, uh, they get there through a random process. So the random selection mixed with random assignments then um, makes those two samples independent. Okay. So knowing what you've learned from the one sample and dependent samples test, how do we go about analyzing this, right? So in the one sample test, we only had one sample and we compared it to a population. So that was fairly easy. We had one mean, we compared it to a fixed population mean, like uh, for, for IQ, that was 100. And that was a fairly straightforward thing. With dependent samples, we you know, were able to subtract scores because this, it was the same person in, in both groups. Uh, or in the case of matched pairs or something, they're, they're, we're going to treat them as if they're the same person. We can subtract them, and then we sort of approached it again as a one-sample test. But what the thing that actually those have in common that we can see here is that um, there is some general um, format where you know a t observed equals. There's going to be some difference up here, or whether it's a difference between the sample mean and population mean, the difference between scores uh, pre and post. There's some difference on top that we're looking for. And then on the bottom, there's going to be some standard error. This is sort of the stan uh, you know, a standard way of thinking, generic way of thinking about what T-observed looks like. Some difference on top over some standard error. So we need to do that too. If we're doing an independent samples t-test, we're going to have some kind of difference on top with some kind of standard error on the bottom. The top part becomes fairly straightforward. I mean, that, that's the part's easy. We're going to take the difference is going to be between the two samples, right? So now I have a mean of sample one minus the mean of sample two. That doesn't seem too hard. It's how do we estimate or calculate the standard error that becomes a little tricky? Because when it was one sample, we took you know our standard deviation of that sample divided it by the square root of n and figured out our standard error for the mean. Right, it's just pretty easy. One, one sample, one mean. So it's the standard error of the mean, the standard, you know, the standard error um, was pretty straightforward. We just took our one standard deviation divided by square root of n. And even for the the dependent samples test, we just took the standard deviation of the, oh sorry, it actually still was mean. It was the exact same thing. We just gave it some extra labeling to make sure we were referring to the differences. So it was the S of the mean of the difference. We took the S of the difference, differences, and divided by the square root of n. And here the n was, you know, the number of, of pairs of people, or the number of, of individual people because we were subtracting their scores. So it was the same format. The problem now is 
I now have two means, the, the mean of sample one, the mean of sample two, and I have two different standard, standard deviations, standard deviation of sample one and standard deviation of sample two. And I have to be able to rectify that information, somehow include all of that in figuring out some measure of standard error. And that's where um, the extra complexity comes in. I don't just have one standard deviation that I can just divide by square root of n and get a standard error. I have two means, two standard deviations, and I have to figure out how to, to combine these two standard deviations in a way that I can use them to, to calculate a standard error. So when we get to, to step six, like the step, steps one, two, three, four, five, there are, are they're going to be essentially the same as they are uh, in, you know, for a one sample, dependent samples, independent samples. So when you get to step six, that things change. Instead of just being one step where you figure out the t, the t observed by simply taking whatever differences, uh, whatever the differences on top divided by standard error, we have to sort of f do these three steps. There's like two steps we have to do before we get to the finding t0. So the first thing we gotta do is find the best estimate of sigma. So the problem is we don't have sigma, this is a t-test. So we don't have the population information. So because we don't have this, we have to estimate it. Before, when I had one sample, my one sample S was really my best estimate of sigma. I just had one, so that's it, that's all I had. Well, now I have two. That's S1 and I have S2. Both of them are going to be really good estimates of sigma. Right? So why would I want to choose one or the other? I have to figure out some way to combine them. So in a sense, um, the average of those two, not quite, but it's close, the average of those two is going to be an even better estimate of sigma. Right? Because they're both estimating the same sigma. They're both samples from the same population. They're both estimating sigma. So this is an even better estimate than using just one. Right? So I need to figure out a way to combine them. Find some kind of average between the two standard deviations to get a better estimate of sigma that I can use. So that's step one. I'm going to find the best estimate of sigma by using this, uh, the pooled variance, S squared pooled, sometimes simply just referred to as the S squared P for pooled variance. So we're going to, we're going to pool it. Pooling is a fancy way of saying averaging. We're going to, we're going to pool the variances together and to create a, a, something like an average like this to get a better estimate of sigma. We're then going to use the pooled variance to find the standard error. So once we find this S squared for P, this pooled variance, we're going to use that to find the standard error. And then we're going to plug the standard error into our t-test and find our t-observed for the difference between those two groups. So step six for a t-test just has two additional sub-steps that we don't do for our one sample or dependent samples. We're going to first find the pool variance. Now there's an assumption here that to find the pool variance we have to assume, we need to assume that we should. And I'll talk about that in a second. Like maybe we shouldn't pool the variances. Maybe there's a reason why, um, why we shouldn't, but if we assume that we should pool the variances, we're going to do that first. And I'll, I'll explain that in a second. I'm being a little bit vague on purpose. So if, if we assume that we should pool the variances, we're going to do that. And then we're going to use that pool variance to estimate the standard error. And then we can use that to get the t. All right, so three steps to t in step six. That's why there's sort of a 6a, 6b, 6c, where before it could all have been done fairly easily in just one step. So this is sort of rehashing what I just said a second ago, but it, I think it's worth sort of saying again. With one sample, we only had one S, one standard deviation. So that was our best. That was the only thing we got. We just had to make do with what we had. So we used the one S to, as a, as a stand-in for sigma, and we computed the standard error and sort of did the rest of the test. However, with two samples, we have two estimates. 
So what do we do? Well, we just talked about that a second ago. We need to utilize both of those uh, estimates of sigma and figure out a, a better way. So if, you know, if the idea is I'm taking samples from a population over and over again, each one of those samples, their, their standard deviation is uh, a good estimate of the population. If I have two of them, though, I should be able to average the two of them together somehow to get an even better estimate of the standard deviation. If I had three, even better. Four, five, six, the more samples I have, the more I can average across the, the standard deviations, the better estimate of sigma I'm going to get. Um, so we could figure this so we could do this, we could figure this out sort of manually, right? So, you know, if we were taking multiple samples from a population, we could sort of manually figure out uh, what the distribution might look like, the same way we did with the Z and, and T test before, uh, the one sample, we could just manually do it. I'm just gonna take a bunch of samples in the population and subtract their scores or whatever and figure out what, what the differences might look like. And so if we, so to do this, we would, if we draw all possible pairs of independent samples of size N1 and N2. Now, why am I saying N1 and N2? Just like with our sample, we have one group that's only eight, the other group that's 10. So the sizes of the samples matter. So if I'm going to create a, a sampling distribution of the, the differences between these means, I have to keep those numbers um, you know, at the constant. I, I gotta make sure that each sample, when I pull two samples from the population, if I'm doing it for uh, our example with the um, Grand Theft Auto versus Lego, um, I need to make sure that one of the samples is size eight, and the other sample is a size 10 to keep that consistent. And I want to see how the means sort of differ and, and the, different, um, the, the different differences. Because sometimes one sample might be larger and you get, it, you get positive numbers and then you might flip flops and you get negative numbers. So you should get a distribution of, of differences between samples size N1 and N2. And that's what we're sort of trying to develop. So we're going to, calc so we're going to take two uh, samples of, of size N1 and N2 respectively from, from either from two populations or from the same population and um, sort of randomly assign them or something. You're going to record the difference between these values. And what you've created there, instead of being a sampling distribution of the mean, is that you've now created a sampling distribution of the difference between means. All right, so each thing that we've done now, we've calculated the two means of the two samples, and we subtracted them, and created a difference between the means every, for every time we pull these samples out. And if we record that, if we record that out, record that down every single time, and do it, say, you know, crazy number of times, like 10,000 times, we're going to get an idea of just how far these two groups can be from one another and the sizes of those differences, both positive and negative, are going to be. And we can create a distribution of, of differences between means that we'd expect to occur just by chance alone. And then we can look at the differences between our actual samples to see if that difference falls at some extreme side one way or the other of the distribution and see if, if our, our particular samples are unusual and decide, you know, if we, if we think it's significant or not and if we want to accept or reject the null. Okay. So just to, to sort of give you an idea of what this might look like. So mean of sampling distribution uh, for M, uh, for, for the first variable, the mean of X1 is going to be mu1, right? So let's say, let's say that I have the, this is not our, this doesn't match with the, the, um, the example, the Grand Theft Auto and Lego example, but it's but let's say we had two different populations just to keep things sort of straight, and to keep it sort of separate. I have two different uh, two different populations, and I pull um, you know the sample sample one from population one, and I pull you know sample two from population two. These are just two random samples pulled out of the two different populations. I calculate their two means, and I subtract them. And I'm going to get on this side the sort of difference. Here's the you know the the mean difference for between these two groups. And I'm going to put those uh, both those samples back, and I'm going to then randomly select again to do it one more time. So sample one versus sample two, take their means, subtract, put them back. Do it again. Sample one, sample two, subtract their means, put them back. Do it over and over and over again. Some you know infinitely large number of times. Because of the you know, the populations, you know, let's say we're expecting them to be roughly the same. Like there's, you know, the without any intervention, these populations would be about the same. I'd expect that about half the time, the samples from population one are going to be larger than the samples from population two, and I'm going to get positive differences. Um, and 
the other half of the time, the samples from population two are going to be larger than population one, and I'm going to get negative numbers. So I we expect it to start to distribute out in some way that uh, resembles something like this, where I have you know distribution of scores. And again, if we're assuming that the populations are about the same uh, to begin with, without doing anything to them, I would expect this to center somewhat about zero, right? where there's no difference between them. And then half the time I would get positive differences because the sample ones would be larger than sample two, so I get positive numbers. The other half the time, sample twos are gonna be larger than sample ones, so then I'm gonna get negative numbers, and I ex expect something like this, so some distribution of scores that centers somewhere around zero. Okay. And that's under the assumption that the differences between the two populations is roughly zero under the null hypothesis, right? So this could be a different number. Maybe I think there is a, a difference under null hypothesis, but it's assuming there's no difference. So because the mean of sampling distribution for for the, the mean of X1 is assumed to be the mean of the population, uh, and the mean of sampling of the same the mean of sampling distribution MX2, which is the for uh, the sample the sampling distribution for the, the second population is going to be uh, mu2, okay? So the mean of the differences between those two means, the, if I actually would subtract the means, um, the center, whatever this is going to be, is whatever I'm hypothesizing the difference between the two means would be. So this is sort of right in the center there is going to be the mean of the two populations subtracted which will oftentimes um, be assumed to be zero, but there are some cases that's not true, but we're, we'll just stick to it because it's a little easier to talk about. So we're, we're gonna create this distribution of differences between means, and it's gonna center around the population differences. And um, we need to figure out though, all right, what, how far, what's the standard error? All right, that's, this is the part that's sort of tricky. So I want to know how much would I expect the differences to vary? What range would they have um, on the high and low end and the frequencies in which we get them? That's why we did this you know, tens of thousands or infinite number of times. I would get a full distribution that would tell me how often I get sort of scores in the extreme and I could figure out where, you know, where to start making my cutoff for what an unusual difference looks like between two samples. And I could see if my that the two samples that I actually are using, uh, that I'm actually using, um, are significantly different or in this sort of unusual range. So I could I could do this manually, but no one wants to do that. It's not it's not a fun process. Uh, even if you simulate it with computers, it's gonna take a little while to to do that. And enough people have done it to figure out how things relate to each other. So we don't necessarily need to do this process. But this is sort of how it gets the gets understood. What is the the sampling distribution of those differences between means? What would it look like? And are the is the difference between my two samples that I'm using in my study unusual given what we know about how the means should differ from one another on average? Okay. So, because we're talking about a sampling distribution, um, and you know, based on the central limit theorem, the shape of it, uh, just like with the one sample and dependent samples, we expect you know the the shape to be relatively normal if we know one of two things. If the population or both populations that the samples are coming from are normal, if they're normally distributed, and we know that, we're reassured, like say in a, in a practice problem or a test question or something, it says, you know, assume the population is normally distributed, then you don't have to worry about the ends at all. The ends could be sort of ignored. It's gonna be normal no matter what because the populations are coming from are normally distributed. But oftentimes, especially in like real uh, applications in research, we don't know uh, what the populations look like. So all we can really do is just, just be assured that we have um, enough, a large enough N, um, that the, the N1 and N2, the two ends of the two groups, are reasonably large. Now again, we go back to this reasonably large thing that becomes sort of complicated. 
but if we assume just like with a one sample test that each group has roughly 20 subjects in it, then we can forget about knowing about the population and, and just knowing those ends are large enough will give us a normally distributed sampling distribution of those differences um, without knowing anything about the population. So in particular sample, we only have eight and 10. So the, so the only reason you know we can continue sort of looking at this in the, with this test is that we're gonna have to assume that the, that aggressive behaviors for whatever reason is normally distributed in the population so that we can actually apply the test and it actually makes sense based on the central limit theorem that's normally distributed. So we're gonna have to make that assumption because we don't have a large enough N in both groups to sort of consider them reasonably large. So, okay, what if we don't want to do that? What if we don't want to make this? What if I don't want to do, you know, just to, just to compare my two samples, I got I to gotta pull thousands or tens of thousands of samples out just to compare two, it seems that's sort of a ridiculous process. What if I don't want to do that? Well, just like with the one sample, we can estimate it. We can, we can figure out a way to estimate the, the value. So with one sample, we estimate the standard error by if, if you know, in a z-test, we were given sigma, so we were able just to say, okay, well, the standard error of the mean based on sigma is just sigma over the square root of n. Right? So we were able just to directly calculate that. And we saw based on the simulation in the one sample test and the, the calculation based on this equation that we, get, that we got the same number. We estimated it to be about 3. We calculated it to be about 3. It was the same number either way. And when we switched to a t-test, we just sort of replaced uh, sigma with s and our s sub m, our standard error based on s, was just we took our sample s and divided it by the square root of n. So we were able to do that when we had one sample. But here's where the problem comes in. This is where it becomes a little tricky. Well, what do we do with two samples? All right, so the reason why we were able just to just completely replace s in, you know, in for sigma here is because we only had one s. One s is the best estimate we had for sigma, so we just stuck it in there. It forced us to change from a z distribution to a t to adjust for it, but we were able just to plug s in because that's all we had. Well, now we have two. So we can't just plug both of them in. We got to figure some, some way around that. So here, th this is the part of this that probably is the most um, complicated. Uh, the most sort of uh, strange to think about is is why do we um, you know so how do we would we go about uh, estimating a standard error of the mean? This is assuming if if we knew the population standard deviation. So this part this part is a, a big if. If we knew the population standard deviation, how will we go about sort of computing what the standard error, the differences between the two means, would look like? So instead of being a standard error, you know, uh, standard error of one mean, this is the standard error of the differences. This is that exact thing we're trying to find by doing this. So if we actually, you know, took all this stuff down, we can actually figure out what the standard error would look like. Well, we can calculate it directly if we think about a couple things. So one is there's something called the variance sum law. And this is something that actually works, um, and it actually, you know, it, it, it is, it is a, a, a thing that can um, pretty accurately predict uh, how things will go. So if I have two variables, um, like in this case, uh, the, the, the scores in our, um, the scores in our uh, Grand Theft Auto and the scores in our Lego game or something, we had two different variables like that and I wanted to subtract them or I wanted to add them together, I wanted to do some, some way of combining those variables together, the variance sum law tells me some interesting things about what I, what I can expect about the sums and differences of those variables. So the variance, the variance of the sum or difference of two independent samples is equal to the sum of their variances. Say what? So if I'm going to take and create some kind of uh, composite. Let's say um, I'm going to create some super composite that's going to be, uh, I'll just call it composite. I want to, I want to be able to, which is going to be x um, plus y, or x and y are two variables I have. Okay, I want to add x and y together. Well, if I know that x and y are independent, so independent means they're not related, Right? There's no relationship. 
then I know that I can take the, if I want to be able to compute the variance of this composite, I can simply take the variance of x and add it to the variance of y. So if I'm going to add x and y together, the variance of that new variable, the composite, me adding them together, is going to be simply just the sum of their two variances. So that's what it says. The variance of the sum or difference of two independent samples is equal to the sum of their variances. All right, so if I want to just add together two variables, I can figure out the, the variance of the, two, of, the, of the sum of the composite by simply adding together their two, their two um, variances. Now the variance sum law, if you look it up, is a little bit more, there's a little bit more to it than that. It's the variance, and it says plus or minus the covariance between x and y. Um, we haven't talked about what a covariance is, but let's just say this has to do with we're going to add or subtract some degree, whatever the relationship is, the overlap, the correlation between uh, s between x and y. But the trick here is that because we're assuming that they're independent, I mean, this is an independent sample is t, that this is going to be zero. Because they're independent, there is no relationship, there is no dependency, there is no covariance between the variables. So we assume that it's zero and we can drop this part out so that if I want to add them together, I can simply just add their variances. The weird part is, the same is true if I want to subtract them. If I want to create a composite where I subtract two variables, pick x, the, all the, the values in x minus the values in y, and I want to subtract them, I'm still going to add together their two variances to get the variance of that composite. So whether I'm adding together x and y or subtracting x and y, the result is going to, is, is going to be just the, the addition the sum of their two variances. That's why it's called the variance sum rule, because the variance of the sum or difference, either way, of two independent samples is equal to summing up their variances. Okay, so if we knew the variance of the population, sigma, if we knew that, if we knew the variance of the population, we can figure out what the variance of the difference between those two uh, samples would look like by simply applying the variance sum law. So here is the here's the variance of the difference between two means. Right? So here I am subtracting the you know two variables. I'm taking two random variables and I'm subtracting their scores. So the variance of that distribution of differences between means, well I can simply sum up the variance of the sampling distribution for the first variable. This is the the variance of the the sample means around the first um, sample. And this is the variance of the sample means or, you know, for the second sample. And remembering down here that our standard error of the mean is equal to just the standard, devi the standard deviation for that, that variable over the square root of n. All right, well, if I want to make this into a variance, if I want to square this, I want to square this to sort of make it into a variance form, that's going to make this the variance of x1 over over n1, right? Because it's going to get rid of the square root. I wrote that horribly because I'm written sideways. Let me write that again. All right, so if, if, I, if I want to change this, instead of being a standard error, I want to make it a variance form. I want to square the standard error and make it into a variance. So I can square that but that means I need to square both of these parts here. And if I square this whole thing, that turns the top part into a variance, the variance of x1. Great, I just squared that. And then because I'm squaring a square root, it essentially just gets rid of the square root. So I have that the, the variance of, M, uh, of m1 is equal to the variance of the variable it comes from, the variance of x1 over n1, and it's just the squared form. So if I want to figure out what the variance forms are for these two things, to be able to, you know, these are the two variance forms I want, so I can add those up and get the distribution of the differences between the two means, well, 
I can I can take my standard error formula, the equation for standard error, and just square both parts so that I have the the variance of x1, my first variable, over n1, plus the variance of x2, my second variable, and I can just plug those in, add, add them up, and I would actually get this um, variance of the distribution of the differences between the two means. Now, I don't want a variance. I want the standard error. I want it in non-squared units. I don't want the squared units. So how do I get rid of the squares? Well, if I just take the square root of this, which is what's down here, I can get the standard error of the differences between the two means by simply taking the variance of each of the two variables, dividing it by n1, add them together, that's, that's my variance sum law. I can actually add the two together because of the variance sum law. And then take the square root of that, it'll give me the standard error of the differences between the two means. All right, so let's run through that one more time. I want the standard error of the differences between the two means. Well, how do I get it? Based on the variance sum law, I don't need to go through the whole process of finding all of these things. I don't have to go through and do this. All I need to know is, okay, what's the, what's the variance for the first variable? So in this case, let's say, it's, what's the variance for, um, for the, the Grand Theft Auto group? Okay, if I knew the population that it was coming from, I knew the pop, if I knew the, the standard de deviation of the population, well, I can figure that out. I can say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna square the standard deviation or find the variance for the population that that group is coming from. I'm going to plug it in here and I'm going to divide by n because what does that do? It gives me a variance form of the standard error for the means of that variable. I'll do the same thing for the other groups, like in, this case, in our case the, the Lego group. Again, if I knew the population standard deviation that they were coming from, I could plug that in, square it, plug it in, divide by n2, and get the, these two variances that correspond to the, the, the mean distributions, the sampling distributions of the mean for both of those variables, both for both of those, um, yeah, both those variables, the, the Grand Theft Auto and the, and the Lego groups. So I can figure out what the variance would be for the differences between those means by simply adding those together it would give me the variance, but I don't want the variance. I want the standard error. So to get that, I'm going to take the, those two being added together. I'm just going to take those, take the square root of that, and what I'm left with is the standard error. So the standard error equals the square root of the variance of variable 1 divided by n for variable 1 plus the variance of variable 2 divided by the n of variable 2. So I'm going to add those two together, and what this is going to do is sort of give me an, uh, you know, an estimate of the differences between those two means based on this variance sum law. And one way to think about it, this helps, it may not, if you remember like the Pythagorean theorem, right, where, you know, if you, if you know the, the two sides, A and B and C, if I know A and B, I can find C by, by taking um, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But again, I don't, I don't want to find C squared. I want to find C. So to find C, I would simply take the square root of, square, of this to get me back to C again. The same thing. I have two variances, and I'm trying to add them together to find this overall variance. I'm oh, sorry, I, 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 I have standard deviations for these two variables, and I want to find the standard error for, for this. Like the I have the standard error for variable 1, the standard error for variable 2, and I want to combine them together somehow. Well, I can't just combine them. I can't just add them together. i got to square both to determine the variances, and then I can add those together to get c squared. And that's what's in this inside the square root here. Uh, which is this variance here, and then I can take the square root of that to give me back to C. I can actually figure out what the standard error would be by simply taking the square root of the variance form of the standard error. So this allows me, if I know sigma, if I know the value for the population standard deviation, uh, or for the populations, if there's two involved, I can plug those in, I can figure out what the standard error would be if I knew the standard error of the population. So it's simply just square both, add them together, take the square root, and you got your standard error. Right? It's, pretty, it's a pretty, it's, you know, it seems complicated and there's rules and stuff, but it's actually a fairly simple thing. I have two standard errors, 
I want to square them, add them up, and then divide by, uh, uh, sorry, then take the square root of them so that I can get it back to a standard error form that's the difference between the two means. And it's all possible because we know that if we're summing or subtracting variables, the result is going to be the sum of the two, the resulting variance would be the sum of the two variances of the variables involved. That's great. I mean, this seems complicated, but it's like, all right, maybe it's doable. I can sort of, I can sort of get it. We're, we're taking the standard error and we're squaring it because I have standard errors for things, but I can't just add them together. I got to square them first. So I square them both and add them up. And then when I add them up, I'm getting a variance for the differences. Okay, cool. I don't really want a variance though. I want standard error. So I'm going to then take the square roots and that's going to give me the thing I need. It's going to give me this. Uh, the piece, which is the the bottom part of the t, uh, the t observed, I'm just going to give me you know a standard error. It's going to give me the thing I need to 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 compute it. So we figured out all right. So I got mean one minus mean two. My t observed, perfect. I now have a standard error, which is the sigma sub m one minus m two. All right. So I figured out the standard error, and this is my basic uh, difference over standard error sort of format, I need my t to be in. So if I have the population values for this, I can figure this out pretty easily and get my t observed in amount. Actually, this wouldn't even be a t observed. This would like be a z observed because the, the, the sigma is known. But there's the problem. Well, we're not likely to know the population values for these. So even though this is true, we know that if we had this, we could do this. But oftentimes we're not going to have it. So what do we do? How do we how do we fix that? So just like to visually sort of see what this might look like. Where again, you know, we, we know this distribution of the differences between the the means of x one and means of x two. This this difference, right, is gonna it's gonna be because um, these. If I just had one sample, this would be the standard error, right? We can compute a standard error for this one. We can compute a standard error for that one. But because there they're, they're, they're two of them, we're subtracting them, we've got to figure out a different standard error, which is this one. We need to be able to take both variables into account and um, add them up to get the, that c squared, to get the, the combined variance. Take the square root of it to turn it back into a standard deviation, standard error format, and that'll give it. That'll tell us how much we expect the means to differ from each other on average. You know, uh, away from the the mean of this distribution. The problem is we oftentimes don't know these population values. This is not something that's known. So since since these sigmas are. Um, are unknown. We're going to do the best thing that we can to to, to figure that out. So I'm going to use s to estimate sigma. That's what we did before. But s1 estimates sigma. So does s2. All right. So they both estimate sigma, so I have to figure out some way to combine them together. And if I can pool them, which is what we'll talk about next time, if I can pool these two uh, standard deviations together from the two different uh, samples, then I can get an even better estimate. So the, the pool estimate here, this pool, is an even better estimate of, of sigma than either one of these are. This is better because it's using two different samples that are both estimating the same sigma. So it's likely the average of the two of them is going to be an even closer value than either of them could have been alone when trying to estimate the population value.